Dominique Rodriguez Sawyer, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited to have this conversation. We've been preparing for this for a little bit. And uh, you really have a, a unique and interesting background working for an interesting uh, organization. So we'll get more into that in just a moment. Um, but I think you bring a lot of expertise around uh, the people space, particularly, you know, in your role as chief people officer. But uh, looking at leading HR during times of transition and change, which we're smack dab in the middle of right now, uh, everyone is living this each and every day, the disruption of the pandemic um, and virtual work and, and everything related to that, but also just everything in, in relation to the shifting nature of work and disruptive technologies in fact, impacting HR and people management within organizations. I mean, there's so many different things that we could focus our attention on today, but we definitely are going to be talking about um, transition, change, uh, and some of those, the, the things that need to be done to, to manage the HR function and, and the, the people management issues within an organization, you know, as we're, we're dealing with difficult times. As we get started, I wanted to share uh, Dominique's bio with everybody. As the Chief People Officer, Senior Director of HR and Administration, uh, Dominique Rodriguez Sawyer is responsible for the overall strategy development and implementation of HR programs and administrative operations for FAIR, F-A-R-E. And I'll let you describe more about your organization here in a moment. Uh, she has over 15 years of experience in fostering the relationships between HR management and senior leadership of nonprofit and government agencies. Her primary focus is employee relations, workforce planning and recruitment, regulatory compliance, as well as facilitating training programs that improve organizational excellence and nurture the aptitudes of high performance. Dominique has a bachelor's degree in political science and French from Franklin Pierce University and graduate level certification in training and development from North Carolina State University. Uh, again, welcome to the podcast. It's wonderful to have you. Before we launch into the conversation, anything else that you would like to share by way of personal background or context? Oh, no, thank you very much for this opportunity. I think you've pretty much covered it all. Um, a little bit about how I got into HR, because many times people ask me, they'll say, well, you started on one route. Um, I really had a passion for training. Um, and as you shared, I uh, went back and got uh, my graduate level certification in training and development, and then started working in corporations in their training departments within HR, which later led me into working with employee relations teams and becoming an HR corporate partner, which led to where I am today. Yeah, and that's, act that's actually how I got uh, connected with HR initially too. The training and development piece was really what caught my attention and, and interest. Uh, and then over time I got, you know, connected with, with all of the different areas and, and continue with my education. So that's interesting that we have a similar, um, kind of, uh, aptitude and, and interest. I, I think, uh, it sounds like, well, yeah. so Dominique, I think, um, you know, as we, as we launch into this, it's, it's interesting to consider um, all of the, the challenges and changes that organizations are facing. And you've experienced uh, managing HR needs during times of complete organizational turnaround. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Um, what were some of those challenges that you faced during that time? Uh, and then we can, we can, tie that into the pandemic and some of the issues around that. Oh, but actually, before we do that, can you tell us just briefly about FAIR and the organization you're at and what you do? And then we'll, we'll talk about uh, managing HR during a turnaround. Okay, sure. Um, FAIR is the world's leading premier organization on fighting food allergies. Uh, there are 32 million Americans uh, living with potentially threatening food allergies. So our mission here at FAIR um, is to enhance the lives of those individuals, um, empowering them to lead safe, productive lives, you know, with the respect of others. And we do this through a number of ways, um, through education, advocacy initiatives, 
you know, as well as improved awareness around healthcare options and treatments. So that's a quick snapshot of all that we do. Excellent. And I appreciate that. It sounds like a wonderful organization doing really important work. Um, now tell us a little bit more about this experience you've had when you're dealing with an organization going through complete, a, a complete turnaround, a big scale change. Okay. In 2018, uh, FAIR underwent a significant reorganization. Um, it wasn't an easy feat. And I have to tell you, Jonathan, it's probably one of my greatest challenges. First, 45% uh, of the organization was being laid off. So you can imagine crossing my mind were thoughts on how would we maintain morale and continue moving the needle on the critical work of the mission. Um, what can often happen in situations like these um, that is that individuals living through a reorg can become frozen and unsure about their future and thereby becoming less productive. So you have the case where um, there are individuals leaving the organization, you have those that are there, and it's almost like everyone becomes stuck. Additionally, our incoming CEO was evolving FAIR's business approach from a typical nonprofit to a very energetic startup. So the most important thing to me was that we treat our outgoing employees with compassion and respect. I mean, they had invested a lot of, of themselves into it. So it was important that we do that. I would suggest that for any organization going through this, to put a plan in place to offer assistance to the departing employees. So that could include a whole number of things, you know, outplacement services, compensation packages, recommendation letters, et cetera, things of that nature. But then don't stop there because for those remaining, we had to be honest with them and explain the plan to move FAIR forward. So my additional guidance to, those, to, to any organization going through this is that at every step where it's possible, involve the staff as stakeholders, giving them input into the direction and actions that leadership is taking. You know, in our case, we valued staff commitment to seeing the mission of FAIR continue to forge, to, you know, to forge ahead with it by taking into consideration their voice. Um, you know, by doing this, you're optimizing your opportunity for success. Yeah, well, that, that's interesting. And I, I actually uh, had a, a somewhat similar experience, um, not, not as uh, in, in a role like yours, but I was on the board of directors of an organization uh, that was going through a similar transition of a nonprofit to more of a th this kind of learning organization tech startup space, um, mm -hmm. and fundamentally shifting the the nature. I mean, some of the core um, products of the of the organization remain the same, but there were a whole new slate of products and services that were being developed, and really the positioning of the organization just shifted, right? And and moving again into really considering the organization, which was a forty year old organization really moving into like startup space <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and innovation. And it's, 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 it's hard. It's really yes. hard. It's, it's hard on everybody. So I can relate to, to some of what you're describing and being in the, in the weeds and the daily grind of going through that transformation. I can only imagine how hard that would be. I only saw it from the, you know, from the thousand foot view from the board of directors. So that's, that's really great. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about, um, some of the advice that you would give to HR leaders when they're going through similar types of, of challenges uh, within their organization. You know, maybe not a, a nonprofit moving into more of a startup kind of a mentality, but, but <laughs> yeah. you know, we all deal with, with change and with disruption and transition. And, and perhaps it's even just in how we deal with it during times of the pandemic. Right. Okay. Um, it, whether it's during times of pandemic, when you're going through changes, 
oftentimes, and, and I, I guess I'll talk about it in, in the sense of transitions for organizations, um, you, you have to make morale like one of the top priorities that you focus on. I know there's so much going on. You're busy deciding, okay, um, is this product or this event or X, Y, Z, are we going to continue that? That's important. But remember that you need individuals, you need the people, you need the staff to make any idea, any movement that you're about to go through happen. So keep morale in, in the forefront and top of mind. As changes occur, you can do that by continually checking in with your staff and seeing, you know, getting a pulse. Um, and don't forget the HR staff too, you know, because they're the ones that have to check on the, on, on the, the, the team. And so make sure if you're a leader, that you're checking on, on that group that you have there responsible for the team. Um, secondly, I would say uh, advice that I would give is a clarity of mission. So <laughs> once you know exactly what you're going to be doing, be forthright about the direction that the organization is heading in. I'd have to say that one of the things that our new CEO did when we went through our transition is that she explained in a town hall format, the plan to move FAIR forward to everyone. And, you know, that plan was going to take away some events, some things that, you know, individuals were very tied to. Um, but you, you have to be frank, you have to be honest, and you gotta let them know where you're going. I think another item, and finally for me, is figure out the resources needed to up-level the skill set of those staff that remain. So, you know, I have a bias towards training, so getting staff the necessary training they need to prepare them for the new business environment. Because some of the individuals that are there, they're going to be like, wow, we're heading this way. Well, that's not the skill set that I came in. Am I going to survive? Again, if you're not careful, you're gonna have people freezing. So you don't want that to happen. And I would say as part of the plan that you're going through this transition, you need to think about the necessary training to prepare them for the business environment. Now, the pandemic added another layer. So I would also um, suggest that you think about the, the mental effects that the pandemic has had on individuals because once you go through a transition, that's one thing, but the pandemic brought about all of these restrictions, you know, where you don't have, you, you weren't able to go to some of those outlets you may have had in the past if your organization was going through a change. So when I say um, pay attention to the mental health, uh, it, it, we have like an employee assistance program. Um, a lot of organizations can get that. It's a place where employees can go outside of HR, sort of have um, a neutral person they can talk to and, and, and sort of open up, let, let loose and, and, and explain um, things that they're undergoing that they may not feel comfortable letting us know, but I think it is the responsible of an organization to provide that sort of resource. Yeah, I agree. I, you, you spoke to all of your tips there and, and suggestions, I think were, were spot on and focusing on morale and focusing on, on, uh, the, the, the needs of your people, the mental health needs in time of pandemic and, you know, social isolation and just everything around working remotely and, you know, just the stresses of the day. Um, I think that's of, of particular importance. And then I think about the context of this past year. Um, I mean, it wasn't just the pandemic. We, we've had a lot of social unrest um, mm -hmm. this year, you know, political, um, it was a stressful time uh, 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 in the U.S., you know, a, a, a political campaign uh, process, a presidential year, and a lot of stress around that, um, the Black Lives Matters movement and the George Floyd moment, and a lot of these, um, you know, 
racial um, and social justice issues coming to the forefront that people are paying attention to causing stress and strain in addition to all the pandemic stuff that we're dealing with and, and you know organizations trying to pivot <laughs> I like how you mentioned you know that we can't forget about the HR staff um, <laughs> while, we're, while we're considering the needs of our people and I, I, I've seen that at some of the organizations I've worked at where you know it's like the HR people, are, are this, the ones going around trying to help everyone and fix everybody and, and, and make sure everyone's taken care of, but who's taking care of the HR people? So let's not forget about, let's not forget about that. And um, cause that's also very important. Well, I, I was wondering though, I think, you know, with all the great uh, expertise that you have, I think also the lived experience that you have um, as a senior black female HR professional, I think that's worth noting as well. And I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit of your own um, personal experience just this past year and dealing with some of these broader social issues and how they've interfaced with your role as an HR professional in the workplace. Yeah, thanks for that opportunity to talk about that. You know, I've been in the industry a long time as a Black female professional. I feel like my colleagues and I, you know, we've made progress. Um, as you shared, many of the, you know, Black Lives Matter, the news events, we've really seen um, organizations step up to the plate, but there's still much more to be done. Um, recently, I heard the following statistics that uh, one in five C-suite executives is a woman, and then only one in 25 is a woman of color. So the numbers speak for themselves, but movement towards change is there. Honestly, when I started out, there were very few women of color in leadership roles that I could turn to and discuss um, their own professional progression. You know, that's improved now, but uh, if, if um, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement, I needed someone to talk to and say, okay, how would we approach this? You, you, that wouldn't have been there. That wouldn't have existed for me. Um, and, you know, other questions that I might have had to ask when I first started out, you know, how do you navigate this situation? Or how do you bypass being, um, you know, bypassed for a promotion? There's a cultural savviness and understanding that you greatly benefit from when you're mentored by someone similar to you who has been through it. And at one point in my career, I finally had the privilege of working with a Black female VP. You know, um, she was brilliant, a top performer. But what became apparent is that, you know, she would do twice as much work, receive half the recognition. Um, she had to fight for equitable pay even after surpassing her goal. And when I broached the question, um, or others broached it, uh, since she was clearly making a difference to our bottom line, the response was vague. So she was viewed as being too brash or outspoken. Now think about this, for the three young black professional females on our team, um, in viewing her experience, this VP's experience, there was this subtle message being conveyed to my younger junior staff herself at that point. Listen, be careful, you can't be your authentic self. You can't trust that you'll be paid equitably or that your work will fairly be recognized or appreciated. And even today, I'm still hearing those comments. And those comments a lot of times now are being um, like magnified because of all of the social unrest that we went through. I think people are um, being more expressive in terms of voicing that they are experiencing this. But as I told you, I, I do think the pendulum is slowly swinging. You know, personally for me, in regards to uh, equity, now I'm participating in meetings where there's genuine listening. I don't think that was the case 15, 20 years ago. It's twofold. There's both listening and accountability from leadership. You know, I see efforts now within organizations to be intentional and transparent with their staff about asking them their feedback and acting upon it. You know, it's not just a series of surveys that are taken 
and then stuffed in some drawer. There's more of an alignment of actions to words. We've done this at FAIR in my own organization. Within the community, uh, one of the things that we really champion is equitable access for high quality care for all patients living with food allergy. But we're also advocating for that same access um, for our staff and our board. So FAIR's working towards being inclusive and having diverse representation at all levels of the organization from our board to our senior leadership to staffing. So employees wanna see themselves represented in the leadership. So we're working diligently in this space of living what we preach in regards to diversity. I mean, we recently had this three-part virtual round table that I participated in um, on diversity, equity, inclusion, and access where we spent time discussing human resource and talent building practices in DEIA, you know, which led to FAIR's blueprint for access. So those are some of the things I'm doing. It really, I've seen my experience as it's gradually evolved in this area. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I, you know, as a middle-aged straight white dude, you know, I, I can't begin to really understand the the challenges um, that I'm sure you've faced throughout your career. I appreciate you sharing that, though, in your perspective. And I'm, I'm wondering what, I, I, well, I, I should say, I'm also glad that it seems like things are moving in the right direction. Uh, I wish they were moving more quickly, um, but, you know, they they do seem to be moving in the right direction. So that's a positive, And I guess we can build off of that. But what, what do you, what's your hope? for the future of HR, um, you know, not, not just your future, but the future for, for all women, for all women of color, and for HR as a profession as you move into this unknown future, you know, and how, how do we strive for greater, you know, equality in the workplace and just make sure that we're treating everyone with appropriate, you know, dignity and respect that everyone deserves? You know, my hope is that this dialogue on HR equity will not become, um, HR equity and business will not become just a topic amplified for a moment in time, and that this conversation and relevant actions will continue. So, you know, we're heading down the right track, and I think that if we um, uh, sort of let up it, it, th that's how we'll lose this momentum that we now are, are on. You know, um, I guess this additional concern I have is that at one point DEIA will no longer be the it topic of discussion and everyone's gonna move towards a new shiny object and it won't work. This is not something that will change overnight. It is, um, it, it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a progression. You have to progress towards this change. Um, like you and I are having this dialogue right now, um, we're each gaining a better understanding of each other. Uh, equity and diversity, it has to stay top of mind on the agenda. And HR professionals like myself, we must dedicate ourselves to that end of sustaining and consistently advancing this imperative uh, because Real change in equity takes time and effort. So we just can't let up. We just have to keep going so that we can see the fruits of this time and effort. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And I, I appreciate your optimism uh, around this, this topic and, and these issues. I appreciate all the perspective that you've provided and the insights you know, around uh, related back to your expertise in dealing with some of these challenges uh, as well. Uh, Dominic, it has been a real pleasure talking with you today. The time has flown by. Uh, we're about to the end of our time. But I, before we close, I did want to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about what you're up to, uh, and then just give us the last word on the topic for the day. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I am always happy to talk to anyone who has uh, any questions. Um, 
you know, that same mentorship that was given to me for a brief period of time, I'd like to extend that to others. So you can always reach out to me at drsawyer at foodallergy.org. So we continue this conversation and have many more. Like I said, I think we just need to continue to keep um, this top of mind. Um, sometimes if we have each other as uh, to lift each other up, I think that will help make the process easier. But um, it, it's, it's, a, it's an important dialogue that we um, can't discontinue. We must continue forward. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected with Dominique, find out more about what uh, she and her organization could do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.